with us today. He's from Truckee. He's an engineer. He's a green builder. He's an author. As a matter of fact, he's got When Technology Fails. I don't know if that's the name of the most current uh, no, but, book. Well, yeah, I mean, this one is basically the most current, and it's a prepping and survival guide. So this one is, is like green living, sustainable living, prepping, survival, all of those wrapped into one. So some people said, well, I don't care about all that green stuff. And I just... Or they want something small for the go bag, and they said there's no way I'm putting that encyclopedia in my go bag. So, so Matt has two presentations today. The first one, of course, party like it's 1929, and um, he is the essence of green living. I tell you, that's we've had him in in prior green living festivals, and he just hits it right on the head. Please welcome Matt Steiner. So here's some handouts you can pass if anybody wants them. Uh, Now, I like to ask people, it's a small group, so, you know, if you guys decide there's something that I'm not talking about in here, you want to ask me questions about, and we get it done soon enough, then feel free to. Do you get enough? Okay. Uh, how many of you think that we can keep going the way we're going and everything's going to be okay? <laughs> okay. Is that real? Or facetious? Anyway, how many of you think that we passed the tipping point? And that no matter what we do, we're, we're headed for the giant train wreck that we're going off the cliff. Okay. Yeah. And now, how many of you people think that we stand a chance, if we get knocked around really badly, of perhaps <coughs> making the, the drastic changes we need to do to make a sustainable world where we don't, like, totally crash everything? Okay. So in a sense, you're over the edge, but you also think maybe we, we might luck out no. and make it. I mean, humans are pretty adaptable. Right. I'm not sure our current lifestyle will survive, but... Well, I know the current survive. lifestyle won't survive, but humans are pretty adaptable, but the question is, like, if, if we screw up the planet so much to a point where we can't adapt to it, then, then, you know, then that's it. Okay. So, how to party like it's 1929? Let's see. Oops. Wrong button. I used to just click it. There we go. So, back in my grandparents' age, many of your grandparents' age, somebody knew in each town how to make, grow, or fabricate pretty much everything that was needed for a reasonable standard of living. And most of that knowledge is, is either lost or you know hidden in a closet somewhere right now. And so back in 1929, this was, you know, this is this was America. We had it was right before the Dust Bowl, so the Dust Bowl was right after that. Uh, we had you know massive foreclosures and unemployments, a lot like now. I think if we didn't have the safety nets and uh, the, the financial things that the government's done in the last seven or eight years, that we really would have seen a, a total repeat in 1929. What was that a photograph? What town? I think it's Pittsburgh, but I'm not positive. And uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the heavy industrial towns on in the East Coast. I think it might have been St. Louis, but I think it's Pittsburgh. I, don't, I, don't, I put this together a long time ago. So I don't remember that long. This is Sacramento. This is the state capital in Sacramento, and uh, you know this is something that people like to keep out, out of sight, out of mind. Like, like let's just pretend it doesn't exist there. And this was right in visit, pretty highly visible area in the state capital. So I don't think these people are there any longer. I think they've been moved to less visible locations. But many of us are you know, very close to just a couple of paychecks away from being on the street or defaulting on a mortgage or 
you know, under loan. So then the question is, you know, what kind of there's sort of two different questions that this raises. Is one is, can we build a world that's not like this? And that's the question I like to talk about. And the other one is, how do we build personal resilience and community resilience so that on your own personal level, you can do the best you can in, in times like this? And no one really knows. I mean, like right now, it, it looks like the economy's popping back somewhat. You know, it's like it hasn't crashed as bad as 1929. But we're not far from making another big notch down and being in that situation. So I think, you know, most people don't have a real warm or fuzzy feeling about you know, what's going on in the world. And, and I'm not going to, I don't have time to go into all of those different things we're doing on the planet that don't give me a warm, fuzzy feeling, but let's talk about some of the places of the world and some examples of the world, of th places that did well, did okay, and places that didn't do so okay with, with the next notch down from where we are now. Because we're really, it won't take much of a bump in our world to bring us a giant notch down. I mean, it really won't. The big solar storm, EMP attack, um, uh, you know, the Middle East blowing up. I mean, there's a whole variety of scenarios that could, could like, you know, in a few days to a few weeks to a few months, rapidly get us in a situation like 1929 or worse. Okay, so Soviet Union collapsed. Christmas, 1991. The Politburo comes in, it's Gorbachev days, and they said, that's it, it's over. We're shutting down the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, the, the communists, rule of the Soviet Union is no more. So, and what it was is, you know, a lot of people said, oh, this validated the American way and the war we waged on the Soviets and the arms race and we forced them into financial collapse. Actually, it was cheap oil that forced them into financial collapse because the Soviet Union made their money on their oil, on Gazprom, and it was very poorly run and inefficient. And so when we did drill baby drill all over the world and opened up a glut of oil, cheap oil from all around the world, and oil was selling for $10 or less a barrel, they were, it was costing them more to get the oil out of the ground with the Soviet Union than they were selling for, and that's what bankrupted the Soviet Union. So everyone said, oh, Ronald Reagan's vindicated. It's like my cheap oil did it. So what happened? The money was worthless. Life went on through trade and barter in the black market. Now, the Soviet Union is much more resilient to collapse in many respects than the United States because, you see, those people were used to the system not working. They were used to the black market. Most people had kitchen gardens. Every little available space was, like, plotted with vegetables and stuff, so you grew. And so there was a vibrant, locally grown food economy, and it was trade and barter. Now, what happened when your money didn't work? Well, the buses still ran. The lights stayed on. The water stayed on. You didn't get kicked out of your apartment because it was public housing. Now, in the United States, when things crash, and all of a sudden there is no money to pay your light bill, there's no money to pay your mortgage, there's no money to pay you know, your rent, then I don't think they're quite so nice as the Soviet Union to say, oh, you can ride the bus for free, and we'll keep your lights on for free, and we'll keep your water on for free, and you can stay in the house and the heat and the lights and the water stays on. Okay. Now, North Korea. When the Soviet Union collapsed, the Soviet Union was the pipeline that kept North Korea going. It was their long, they had no oil, they had like no coal. So all of their high tech spare parts, all of their energy infrastructure, most of that stuff came from the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union said, we're out of business. Then North Korea was out of business. So what did that mean? That meant that Millions and millions of people died and starved. They had harsh winters there. It meant that if you were not a part of the government or the military, that you didn't get fed, that you didn't have lights, you didn't have power, you didn't have heat in, in winters that went below zero. So many people stayed alive by foraging in the hills for edible roots and, and plants and bark. The rats were gone, the mice were gone, the squirrels were gone, the rabbits were gone. Uh, the grass was pulled up to eat the roots of the grass. This is, the one, this is how people survived in North Korea when things crashed. Yeah. Horrible, horrible standard of living. Now here's Cuba. Now granted, Cuba is a much better climate than North Korea, but they also had a much more compassionate government than North Korea. They had a government that actually cared about their people. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, the same thing happened in North Korea, that 
There was no money. There was no spare parts. There was almost no oil or gas or anything. But of course, they had a tropical climate. But what they did there was Cuba survived by switching to organic farming and draft animals. And they switched to homeopathic medicine and herbal, traditional herbal medicine and trade and barter. And the average Cuban lost 25 pounds and dropped 25% off of their tour intake. And life went on quite well, and actually the average Cuban probably got healthier instead of the average Cuban um, dying or nearly dying of starvation like happened in Korea. So, okay, what matters most when the money is gone? Well, community and family. Now, here's a story, too. Some people think about, well, okay, what do I need to prepare for a time when things aren't working so well in the world? Well, when I met my wife, she had this, uh, she, my wife's parents was, her father was from Holland, her mom was from Indonesia. They went through World War II and the Indonesian Revolution. And uh, so they knew all the Dutch Indo immigrants in the Bay Area. And they had this wonderful lady named Dee, big, roly poly, jolly, really happy lady, really great. And Dee came, now Dee grew up in there in her sweetheart when she was like 14 or 15 or 16 years old. And they lived in a little shack, a little tiny farm, and yet she came to America with a little bag of jewels. Now how would someone who grows up living in a little tiny shack and a little tiny farm in the hills of Indonesia come to America with a little bag of jewels? Well, when people were starving, they'd take their necklaces and they'd pry a little jewel out, a ruby or an emerald or a diamond. And they'd go to the little shacks and they'd trade a sack of rice for one of those jewels. So when you think about things to store, you know, think about your reserves, think about, you know, where you are, and think about how that bag of jewels probably bought a hundred dollars worth of rice and grain and food during good times when things were normal. And so, when you think about storing, think about not just storing like gold and silver, which is a great thing to store, but think about trade and barter, because you can buy a lot more trade and barterable stuff now when the world's still working well, than, than you will buy with when things are falling apart with that blue, you know, bag of silver coins or gold and all of that. So it depends. I mean, if you've got tons of money, do both. I mean, I don't have tons of money. I, my net worth was more when I got out of high school than it is right now. And so, uh, so I'm in the situation where I have good cash flow. It flows in, flows out, but, you know, whatever. I didn't go bankrupt. Probably should have, but I'm pulling my way out. Okay. So then let's think about skills. Now, some people, think about developing where your strengths are. Like if you're older and you don't, you know, you're not physically vibrant, then what kind of skills and knowledge do you have? Uh, if you have, if you're financially doing fairly well, then stock up on supplies. They're good for trade and barter. Because really, when things go down, it's there's there's sort of two camps. There's the lone wolf camp and there's the community camp. And the lone wolf, you know, if you're an incredible MacGyver and you're really great with guns and ammo and all of that, well, you may do okay, but you may find that somebody who's meaner, tougher, has, has a bunch of friends and is well organized will come and take all your cool stuff away. Whereas if you've got community and you have something to offer and you pool your resources, there's strength and there's, and there's uh, security in community that you don't have as the lone wolf. And then there's entertainment guy. Musicians, alcohol, whatever, you know, so it, it's like, think about your strengths. Humans are social animals, so, you know, look around and, uh, you know, it's the people around you that will be helping you out and you'll be helping them out when times are tough. And most of us, we're social animals. We do better in groups than alone. And in community, nobody knows it all. I mean, I have, I have a Bachelor of Science from MIT, and, uh, and I grew up hunting and fishing in Vermont, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a carpenter and a contractor, and I've, I've you know, thrown pots and pit fired pots and, and cast metal from scratch and, and blown pottery, and I do alternative herbs and medicine, and I've been a mountaineer and an extreme skier and all of that, and I don't know it all, but I know a lot more than the average person. So in a community, you know, I mean, ask me to settle, you know, to operate on someone. I have no clue. So, in a community, you can share your strengths and resources. Now, in um, the, the community renewable energy resource co-ops have been really successful in Europe, and that's where 
They'll have like an energy co-op and they'll pull, they'll bring money and they'll build wind farms and alternative energy locally. So that the local grid has some resilience because it's not just based on the big corporations keeping it going. So that if things fall down, one, one of my friends says, if we could generate 10% of your power with renewable energy. See, most of us can't afford a full renewable energy system that will support a Western lifestyle, because it's very expensive. I and mean, if you got the money for it, great. But if you can support 5% or 10% of your normal consumption, then you'll find that when things fall apart, that 5 or 10% of what you normally consume will be an incredible luxury, because it'll keep lights on, it'll keep your refrigerator going, it'll run the fan in your furnace. It will, you know, allow you to hook into the internet or you, you know, charge some batteries. So, so think about in terms of like, you know, the goal of doing 100% of your energy renewable. It's a great goal. It's just beyond the financial reach of most of us. So, if you can set your bar a little lower, you'll find in a situation when it counts that that will be incredibly valuable and useful. Okay, coping with a changing world. Charles Darwin said. It's not the strongest of the species to survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. No one's the one most adaptable. So it's resilience and adaptability is what you want to think in terms of now. Because I don't know the future, but let me, let me, I will say, in 1997, Thanksgiving in 1997, I was, I had a 20-year practice of prayer and meditation at that moment in time. And I just, Sometimes I wish I never said it. I just asked for guidance and inspiration. And I got this vision, a holographic storyboard outline, pictorial, like, like artists will outline all the scenes for a movie in pictures. And I received this massive pictorial outline for a book, a huge book, to help people live more sustainably and prepare to cope and deal with collapses in central services for significant periods of time. Now, my first thought was like, no effing way. I mean, I don't know all this stuff. And the little voice in my head, and Jesus calls it the still small voice, said, you know, nobody knows it all. And uh, assured me I had the skills and talents that if I chose to take the assignment on, then I'd do it. Well, I didn't just jump right up and say, well, you know, God talked to me today, and I'm going to write this really cool book to you know, help people live more sustainably and survive coming difficult times on the planet. It took me about a year to decide maybe I could do it, another year to write a proposal and sample chapters and you know, do a bunch of research, and then the third year I got a contract with a publisher, it turned out he was bankrupt that never paid me past my initial money, but um, anyway. So I racked up the credit cards and hired artists and you know, worked 70 hours a week for a year, and it was the first edition of this, this and then I put another year of labor into the second edition. So. So you have all the equity in my home uh, <laughs> right here. And uh, it, none of you have to do that. <laughs> so anyway, I could have built a great earth ship, bought five acres and built a great earth ship for what I got in that book. But whatever. You know? A lot of people have said there's stuff like in the healing chapter that's helped people turn their lives around. And so I'm grateful I've been able to help people. And this information will be useful for me sometime. Now, one of the things from my vision was I realized that as a MIT trained mechanical engineer who's also good with his hands and you know machine shop and carpenter and all that stuff, uh, if I was dropped in the middle of the Amazon basin by myself, I couldn't duplicate anything from our high-tech world and I might not even survive. And I'm far more equipped than the average person. Okay. So the intuitive edge. Now millions of years of natural selection have built this most incredible survival mechanism into each and every one of us. Now some call it your gut feel, some call it your spirit guide, some call it the Holy Spirit. I don't really care what you call it, but it's in each and every one of us regardless of religious and spiritual affiliations and beliefs. Now, those people that did not have that in their DNA, well they got popped in the pot by the cannibals, or they got died in the battlefield, or the saber-toothed tigers ate them, or whatever. So it's in every one of our DNA. Now we've been trained in the Western world to kind of ignore this, to think the rational mind. But realize that when this, this inner compass, this inner guidance system can see around corners and can guide you. And when in a crisis situation when there's like 
We don't have information. The information is terrible. There's no phones. There's no CNN. You don't know what's going on. This inner compass can help you to do exactly the right action at exactly the right moment. The hard part is your mind's going to go 100 miles an hour filled with fear. And you know you can't trust your rational mind when it's changing its mind every second, whatever it is. So it's like, oh, I think I should do this. And then a minute later, no, I think I should do that. Okay, so it's like that's when you have to calm that down and, and, and get in touch with this uh, intuition that can see around the corners. Now there's an exercise, I don't want to run out of time in the talk, so um, if we get to the end in enough time, I'll come back and teach it. But it's the pit of the stomach. It's in both of my books. And, uh, and I'll teach it at the end if I don't run out of time. Okay. So remind me. It's, it's a really good thing. It could save your life someday. Okay. So now here's solutions. Like how can we have this sort of resilience to party like it's 1929? So community-based energy co-ops. I was talking about that before. Where you're actually generating energy locally and, ha and putting it into the grid and have some control over it within your community or the immediate area. So in terms of a long-term grid failure, then you have at least some local resilience to get going at, at some level. Uh, Self-reliance skills, strong community, buying and growing local. You, know, you guys have probably heard about buying local and have the multiplier effect that you know when I go pay Billy Joe, 10 bucks for something, then he's got 10 bucks in his pocket, he goes and he buys something at the store, and it goes around town. So the more you can buy locally, locally made, locally grown stuff, then the more that dollar keeps circulating around the community rather than going to some corporate coffer somewhere, or going to some far, some place in the Middle East that hates America and is getting incredibly powerful and wealthy because of all of our money that's going in their pocket. Okay. Low-tech school skills, tools, and markets. Um, you know, develop some hobbies, uh, backup or off-grid renewable energy systems. You know, something like I said, that 10%. You can make 10% of your power renewably. Or in my case, I have a, a trailer with a solar panel on it and an inverter and and a good charge controller and some big you know golf cart batteries. So at least I have something I can charge batteries off of it. I can you know run water pumps. I can, I can, you know, even if my house isn't powered, at least I've got that. I mean, I've got generators and all that stuff, but if things are down for a long time, I'm not going to have gas for my generators. So think about multiple levels of redundancy, because in a long-term situation, your stuff's going to eventually all fail, all your high-tech stuff. So think about kind of redundancy. If you can afford it, think about redundancy. If you can't afford it, think about the minimal you can afford. Grab and go kits. Uh, that's something so that, I mean, we live in earthquake and wildfire country. You don't have as much wildfire to worry down here as I have a truck that is surrounded by forests. But, you know, this is a major fault line running through here in Reno. And they had a pretty good size, like 7 point something, I think, in, in Reno in like 56. And there was like nothing to Reno did. I mean, it was just a cow town. And we haven't had a big one in the area since then. So, you know, the Washoe Valley, Reno, Carson Valley there. You, in this day and age of active earthquakes, it's a very significant possibility. All of a sudden, we could have no natural gas for six months, you know, no power, no water flowing, all those things. Think about that. Um, so grab and go kit is something that you can purify water. It gives you and your family something, whether you have to put it on your back, in, in, in some case, like I live, if there's a big earthquake where I live in Truckee, the bridges on both sides of me are going to go down. Um, water heaters are going to fall over. Fires are going to break out. Fire people won't be able to fight all those fires. And so, worst came to worst, I'd have to put things on my back and go down, head down to the river and carry whatever I could because it's going to take all of my full stuff in that wildfire and there's going to be no, like, no stopping it. Um, I hope it never happens, but I'm at least you know, have that possibility back on my backcountry skills. Okay, so here's here's my Arizona survival last hand. Um, this guy teaches survival. I, it might have been Cody Lundin. I don't know. It was a long time ago on a radio. I had no clue who Cody Lundin was. It probably was him, but you know, we were kind of sharing a radio show. And he said, "Well, I teach primitive living skills and survival in Arizona." And he says, "Almost." Inevitably, the, the class splits up into two groups. The men and women are on one side. And the, the, I mean, the men are in one group and the women go in their own groups. And they go out for a three-day, not exactly solo, but they're not allowed to bring like a lighter 
uh, a knife, you know, no, no tools that are other than what they can make and fabricate in nature after they take this class. So come day three, the starving men, usually hungrily, the women take pity on the starving men. Because see, the men have been focusing on doing the manly stuff of hunting and fishing. But they don't have a gun, and they don't have a fish hook, and you know, they don't have a knife, and they don't have stuff to make snares unless they can go out and, and you know, spin, spin the, 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 make thread and cord naturally. And, but the women have focused on foraging for edible fruits, nuts, and berries. So the women did just fine. And without their high-tech tools, the men got like nothing. <laughs> and so, so in a, in a collapse type scenario, like, like how many of you guys are hunters? You guys, come on, I'm in the bathroom. Okay, how many of you have had a really good day in the last day of hunting season? The last day. The last day of hunting season. I mean, Tags. I saw a woman who said I got a 10-point elk in the last day of hunting season. A woman, at like a talk I gave in, sometime in the last year. And she was like only one of two people who ever had a good day in the last day of hunting season. So people, so all the guys kind of think, well, I've got my guns and my stuff, and I'm going to go out and fish, and I'm going to be fine. But we get, we're in a, a country now that is not like, you know, 5 million, you know, 10 million in Native Americans in, in the United States. It's 300 million people. And it's a well-armed 300 million people. And so everything, in, you know, I grew up hunting and fishing in Vermont. First day out of hunting season, man, you know, the game's all over. You always want to go out first day. Because the ducks and the geese and the deer, they don't know what's going on, you know. And it's like, boom, boom, oh, I got my ducks, I got my deer, whatever. Last day of hunting season, the ones that survived, they know that they're going to make themselves scarce. They're really hard to find. So. In a collapse type scenario, you're talking like a hundred last day of hunting season going on forever and getting a hundred times worse. So think like foraging, trading, bartering. Don't think on your hunting and fishing skills pulling you out of it. Think about them supplementing a little bit here and there, but pulling you out of it and just counting on them. No. Transition communities. Now, transition town movement is a movement, uh, Ron Hopkins wrote a great book, Transition Town book and he started this movement in England and spread around the world and it's about building local resilience so that communities can cope with the coming uh, decline in oil based society. In other words, we've been pumping oil out of the world, all around the world we've been pumping tons of oil and the really easy to get stuff's mostly gotten. So now we're resorting to tar sands and deep wells five miles under the five miles underneath the uh, in the Gulf oil, you know, in the, in the Gulf, five miles underneath the ocean. So we're, we're getting down to not exactly the bottom of the barrel, but we're in the second half of the barrel and it's not so hot. And there's, it used to be that the world's economy could pump, every year we could pump 10% more oil than we did the last year. As long as the economy wanted it, we could just ramp it up and do that. Well, for, since 2003 to 2005, we're flat. In other words, we got all the money in the world to pump that oil, to find that oil, to, to get the oil, and yet we were discovering 10 times as much oil every year in 1964 as we are now, and we're now pumping about four to five times as much oil every year as we're discovering. So that's like charging $20,000 on your credit cards every year, or $100,000 on your credit cards and paying $20,000 off. You know, you can only keep that up for so long. So right now we're in the situation where we're charging 100 grand on our oil, on our oil bank account every year, we're paying 20 grand off. So you know that's going to catch up to us in the fairly near future. Okay. So we local. So the transition town movement is about developing resilience and the ability to cope with these changes. But it's really a great movement, not just for oil. It's about what's happening in the world on multiple levels. And so. It's relocalizing agriculture, developing local mass transit, and the ability to live with little or no auto use, local energy co-ops, community ownership of energy projects, and networking, and local trade and currency, trade and barter. Okay, three Bs. Now, uh, three Bs are beans, like food and supplies, it's, it's all kinds of things. Water is really important. At least your ability to purify it or get it. You don't necessarily need to be able to store it. Like, I have springs right around the corner from my house, so why would I stock big giant barrels in my garage when I can go around the corner to the spring anytime I want? But I do have the ability to purify it. If I have to leave my house, I have portable things to bring in my bag. Bullets, 
Well, it's just protection. Now, protection you can also think in terms of community and and your friends and your partners in the community. And not, you know, in other words, if you're not into guns and ammo yourself, maybe you can store some, so in the event it happens, you can share them with people who are into that. Or maybe you can provide the protection for others that are not so inclined. And then band-aids, that's first aid medicine and healing. When, uh, you know, when perhaps for a long period of time you don't have much access to high-tech medicine, what, what kind of alternatives can you do? Now, training skills and practice is really important. And so if you can't afford the supplies, then focus on your training skills and practice. And if you can't afford the supplies, try to put some time into training skills and practice, too. Um, but, you know, it's like wherever your strengths are, focus on them, but try to diversify. So it means, you know, you start simple. And if you don't have much money, focus on dry stuff, like, you know, sacks of rice and grains and beans. And properly stored, now, for instance, whole wheat, if you store it properly, I don't have time to go into all the details, but. You store it like with dry ice in sealed buckets with mylar liners or, or you put some diatomaceous earth in there so if some bugs do hatch in your grains, they don't have a big feast, they, they kill themselves. Whole wheat properly stored can last for centuries, thousands of years actually. Brown rice is pretty rancid in about three years. Uh, you know, it's still edible for a while after that, but you'd rather not. And when things get really rancid, it can make you really sick. And then there's shelf life versus real life. Uh, the Mormons. I don't have the whole thing memorized. In my new book, When Disaster Strikes, I've got some of that stuff from Mormon research. And they found that, you know, most cans are good, like the real shelf life of, I mean, the, actual, the, the official shelf life of like meats is like one to three years. Acidic fruits is like one to three years. Uh, you know, some things five years. Some canned stuff, according to Mormons who do a lot of food storage, okay in like the 10 to 15 year range. Um, like drop powdered milk, stuff like that, only 10, 20, 25 years kind of range, it's still okay. So, so there's sort of like official shelf life and real shelf life, but don't save money by getting stored food from dented or damaged cans, because when a can is dented or damaged, then it compromises its ability to protect with the inner layer to keep it from rotting out. So your food could get botulism or go bad or, or, or eaten through the can. My mom was a pack rat in a hoarder, and we had a big pantry. Uh, or, or a root cellar with all kinds of stuff stock. And when we finally cleaned it out when I was a teenager, there was a whole bunch of cans that were like dry and rattly. And uh, so canned food does not last forever. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And there was bulging cans. Don't eat the bulging cans. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's like recipe for death. Okay, I already told the honey versus foraging story. So bullets, guns and ammo are great for trade and barter, personal protection of honey. Safety is a must. I was almost a statistic as a kid. I almost blew my brains out. Um, so be really careful. Uh, you don't want your neighbor's kid to become a casualty or someone in the heat of anger to you know, shoot somebody else. So it's like, be careful, store the stuff well, uh, locked cabinets, you know, and split things, the guns and ammo apart in case kids get into it. Use judgment. I mean, some people won't care because they're not in a situation where some child or, you know, grandson might be there, might get into the stuff. Safety in numbers. No skill, supply the ammo. No money, supply the skill. Okay. Band-aids. Antibiotic resistance strains of superbugs. I mean, how many people have heard of MRSA? Okay, methicillin resistant staph. So we've got a whole bunch of superbugs. There was that guy who was flown around on the plane. He was honeymooning in Europe. And uh, the CD, he'd been tested. He had a bad cough, and they tested him. So he was in Europe on his honeymoon when they found that he had extreme drug-resistant tuberculosis. So they were like chasing him around the world. They finally got marshals to, to, uh, to, you know, to, to isolate him in Canada. And then they flew a CDC jet up with guys in bunny suits, you know, masks and like ET suits, to escort him. It was that serious that that worried down. Extreme drug resistant tuberculosis is real and is in large parts of the world right now. You know, it's pretty, there's a lot of people with it in the Soviet Union, there's a lot of people with it in Eastern Europe, there's people with it in South America. These are things that are really, really tough to heal. So what you want is, you want to have a bag of tricks. That to give in part of your resilience. You want to have some herbs. You want to have homeopathy. You want to have colloidal silver. You want to have a variety of things. And there's a really excellent chapter on it in When Technology Fails. There's a smaller chapter on it with a few new updates in When Disaster Strikes. And, there's, and if you don't have money for a book, 
you go to my website, wintechfails.com, there's some really great, totally free articles, really good information. So if you don't want to buy a book, that's fine. Go, to, go there and do yourself a favor, like download uh, How to Protect Your Family from the Next Superbug. Download, you know, what, what I recommend for your grab-and-go kit. All, those kinds of things, all free on the website. Um, now, it's not just about antibiotic resistance, which is big. It's also about if things are down for a while and you have no access to pharmaceuticals at all. Just think about, you know, what things should I stare? I mean, I've got heart medications I'm on. So, you know, think about, like, stocking up things that you really have a time, hard time doing without. If there's a few months or a few weeks or a year or more where you have no access to these, you know, think about those critical things. And CPR and first aid. I mean, I've, I've never had to do CPR, but I have saved a severed finger and I have had to keep you know, the airway open on a woman who would have suffocated on, from a skull fracture. So, you know, the, the first aid and CPR are really important things to know. Now, here's some top alternative healing tools. Now, MMS, Miracle Mineral Supplements, it's kind of noxious stuff. It tastes almost like you're drinking bleach. Um, it can't, I'll, I'll warn you that no thing I have found is, a, you know, it may sound like it's the greatest thing since sliced bread that cures everything, but I haven't found anything that cures everything. <coughs> but I have I found a variety of things that cure stuff that, when drugs aren't curing them, but, you know, they still work. So MMS, you can find it on the internet. There's free downloadable books on how to make it. Go cautious, go careful. It's made from sodium chloride activated with, uh, like, vitamin C. Not, not vitamin C, uh, ascorbic acid, right, or lemon juice or vinegar. Vitamin C is actually an antidote. Yeah, vitamin C, like, white, if, like if you're feeling sick, like you took too much MMS, pop some vitamin C and it's, and it's gone. It's out of your system. It, it, it'll uh, deactivate. It's, it's branded with three-day cures of malaria, 100%. Uh, every, works every time in Africa for pennies. And it's really, I mean, these are people who are, you know, it's very cheap. It's really cheap stuff. And I personally, though, have a, have a very, very tough to cure fungal problem that I built up from rock climbing in these shoes in the 1970s that had a rubber layer in it. A bunch of us rock climbers got a toenail fungus. And it doesn't respond to pharmaceuticals, it doesn't respond to over the counter things at all. So I kind of keep it under control with various herbs. And the MMS made it really bad. Like, it's taken me a year to get back to where I was a year ago from playing with MMS on myself. And so, and it turns out that Jim Humble, who's the inventor of MMS, and he's used it to get rid of skin cancers and malaria, and he saved his guys on, on his gold mining operation in the middle of nowhere in the Amazon basin, uh, when they, you know, didn't have enough time to get somewhere to get to get the malaria stuff, and he used MMS, that's how he actually stumbled on MMS, was, you know, kind of figured it out. Uh, but he himself has a fungal problem that the MMS has made worse. So you know, he's cured cancer with it, but he's got fungus. So you know, it's like so use wisdom. Okay, colloidal and ionic silvers. Well, 2,000 years ago, Alexander the Great did not know anything about blue, anything about germ theory, but he knew that if he stored water for his men in skin bags or wooden urns, you know, wooden barrels, that something happened to the water after a few days, and his men would get sick. And in, in a uh, warrior who's puking and vomiting on the battlefield isn't good for very much. But he also knew that if he stored water in silver urns, then his men stayed healthy. And a healthy soldier is a much better, a more effective soldier. So it turns out that tiny charged particles of silver have this almost magical property where they bond to proteins in, in uh, bacteria and they, they basically make them suffocate. They can't metabolize oxygen, so it kills them. Now, here's, this will sound a little bit like the tooth fairy, because it, turn, it turns out that they kill the good bacteria. They don't kill the good bacteria in your gut, they kill the bad bacteria in the cycle of the right. Well, it turns out that the, the same extra thick cellular wall that protects the probiotic bacteria that live in our gut from full strength stomach acids also protects them from colloid of silver getting through the cellular wall. So, um, at least that's the most commonly accepted uh, reason, you know, given by medical guys for why it works. Now, I'm going to caution you if you can overdo it with silver. They had this guy on Fox News, he was turned blue, he looked like Papa Smurf. 
<laughs> well, he pounded about, he made oil and silver like a quarter day, he pounded a quarter day for 16 years. He had a skin condition that wasn't responding, like really bad psoriasis, and he rubbed it all over his skin and he drank a quarter day. Plus, for most, if not all of this time, he was making it by the bad old advice where you add a pinch of salt to speed up the process. Well, it turns out when you add salt, you're supposed to make colloidal silver with, I use DNI, DI water from an RO, reverse osmosis filter. You're supposed to use uh, distilled water. But I, you know, we got pretty clean water around here, not a lot of dissolved solids. I run it through my reverse osmosis filter. That's what I use. And I talk to a bunch of other people who do the same thing in their own client. But he was adding the salt, and when you add the salts, you get much more silver in the solution, and you also get silver chlorides. They're not nearly as effective, and they're more prone to argyria. So, yes, he abused it for 16 years and turned blue, so you can't overdo it. But if I'm given, 100 years ago, 25 to 50 people would turn blue in America every year, because the most effective medicines against bacterial influenzas and things were all silver-based, and they had tons of silver in them compared to modern colloidal silver generators. They had like a thousand times as much silver in those medicines. And yes, 25 to 50 people in America would turn blue, but they'd save 100,000 lives with that silver medicines. And so, okay, it, it, you know, it has its good and its bad. Now you can also buy, it's kind of expensive, but it's been proven effective against uh, viruses. It bonds to the viruses and deactivates their bonding sites and viruses. And in fact, it was a, uh, this company, American Biotech Labs, had silver mines, and the price of silver had dropped because of offshore imports. So where they was costing them more money to make minus, minus silver, they wanted to keep their guys going. So they started playing with colloidal silver, developed this high voltage process, and all of a sudden they realized something's different about it. Turned out they had a nanoparticle silver, and they found it was very effective in very low concentrations, and it's actually effective against viruses. Well, they sent it to a lab, a um, National Health Sciences lab, NHL lab, in Utah State University to do some work on it. And, at the, and the guy was in charge of the studies, and he was going to, he had just read an FDA paper saying how bogus silver was, it was terrible, it was toxic, and it was really bad for you. So he went out of his way, he did three times as much studies on it as he was paid to do planning on showing how bad it was because he believed the FDA paper. And instead what he found was how good it was. That it was you basically needed to consume a swimming pool amount of it to be toxic. And there's no medicine, some pharmaceutical medicines that, you know, their toxicity is like thousand times more than the silvers. And it also deactivated bird flu virus far better than Tamiflu or any any well any known pharmaceutical. So this guy who was doing all this extra work to try to prove how bad it was ended up becoming a real believer because he saw how there was nothing we had as good as that. Another broad-based thing to have in your bag is grapefruit seed extract. It's broadband antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal. You can get it at most health food stores. Typical, it tastes terrible, so dilute it in a full glass of either juice or water. Uh, if you don't dilute it enough, you'll be like, whoa, this is horrible. But when it's diluted, it's okay. Uh, and especially if it's in with water. Used for Lyme, Candida, Giardia, Amoebic Dysentery, Athletes, Foot, all kinds of different things. Uh, Beck Protocol. And um, this is in, the Beck Protocol is in both of my books. The MMS is only in the newest one, which you didn't know about. Uh, Beck, Bob Beck was this guy. He, he, uh, he was a physicist and electrical engineer and an inventor. When he was 16 years old, he invented the electronic flashbulb. So if you're old enough, you remember the, the you know, the click flash bulbs and use maybe one that spun anyway, you know, use the, the bulb itself was only good for one flash. It was it was like the old days. So he invented that in high school and started making like bulbs for uh, the National Geographic people. He sold it for an incredible amount of money, sold it for a thousand dollars and it paid in those days for his last year of college. Well the guy who bought it made twenty five million off of it. <laughs> anyway, when he was like about late 40s, he led a sedentary life, um, lousy diet, no exercise, and his health was really taking a dive. And the doctors basically said, sorry, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. Some people age early and, you know, go out early, and you're one of those guys. So he thought, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a medical researcher, I'm, I'm on the board of these different companies, and I'm an inventor, and I'm really not going to take this line down. So he went out and searched through the literature, and he came up with a protocol of like 
three, sort of four different things, and he developed these fairly low-cost devices to do this. So he, he, he read this book, and this is a little confusing for me for a while, because his name was Bob Beck, and he read a book by Robert Becker called The Body Electric. And Robert Becker was an orthopedic surgeon and medical researcher who researched the body's microelectric healing mechanisms. And, and he came up with charged silver particles to fight bacteria. He was able to save several of his patients from amputation who had infections that weren't responding to bacteria. And they were scheduled for amputations using the silver particles. So Bob Beck, the physicist, went to sleep one night thinking about the medical research of Robert Becker, the medical researcher, and wondering how he could make these charged silver particles. When he woke up in the morning with a modern colloidal silver generator in his head, and three nine volt batteries, and you put them across, you know, two little pure silver wires in solution, and it looks like tiny particles of smoke coming off of it. And he just got that in his dream. <laughs> so anyway, he then came up with a better circuit. So there's this company called Soda Instruments in Canada, S-O-T-A. There's links to them on their website. If you click through the link, you get a 10% discount, and I get a tiny bit of kickback. So it helps us both. But um, it turned out that this lady was suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome. She'd been an athlete. She was on the board. She was like on the board of an athletic clothing company, and her health was taking dive. She she was sleeping 14 hours a day, put on 70 pounds of weight, and couldn't do the laundry, and couldn't cook for her kids, and felt like committing suicide. So her husband, who's an electrical engineer, heard about a, a, a lecture being given by Bob Beck on his Beck protocol he developed. So they went and listened to the lecture, and they teamed up with Beck, so he started making the instruments. Well, she, he just made the instruments for himself, for Beck's, Beck told the world how to do it. And she, in, in one month, she was much better, and in three months, she totally healed. So she had three years of Western science and medicine doing the best they could to try and heal her, and she got nowhere and felt like killing herself. And in one month, she was significantly improved, and in three months, 100% better with the back protocol. Now, people are using it to heal cancers, hepatitis C, all kinds of things. I'm not a doctor. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm just sharing people's experience. So the Beck protocol is three things. One is colloidal silver. Two is uh, blood electrification. See, Bob Beck also read this research in a patent from Albert Einstein University that if you took your blood out and ran a certain level of low-frequency ch electric charges through it, that it killed all pathogenic bacteria and viruses within the blood. So they patented a machine like the kidney dialysis machine where you take your blood out, electrify it, and put it back in. So Bob Beck said, well, I don't, that's invasive and I don't really want to go do that. So he figured out that you could take two little electrodes and strap them to your wrist with some water on a wristband and run the circuit through it. It feels a little weird. You know, you sit there watching TV and it's kind of a little unpleasant. But it's, your body is pumping the blood through the wrist. You're not breaking the skin and it's electrifying it through the skin. So that's the second part of the Beck protocol. The third part is magnetic pulsing. See, there's lymph nodes and other, other organs that don't have blood flow. And so uh, he figured out that if you have a real strong magnetic pulse, you induce microelectric currents, eddy currents, underneath the pulsing pad. So you can put it on your lymph nodes and stuff like that to help kill bacteria and viruses in those parts, hiding in those parts of your body. And then the last one he found was that when he did this, the first three parts of the protocol, the people would feel kind of sick. It's called a Herxheimer reaction, because what it is is we have all this bacteria and foreign things living in our body. A, a really significant part of your body mass is not you. It's, it's other stuff living in you. And when you start doing this protocol, it starts killing you. Okay, we're running short on time. So I guess I won't get to the uh, pit of the stomach exercise. What are called the smart Okay. And uh, so I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So the ozonated, he found that when you oxygenated your, your, your blood, that it helped the body dump all these toxins. See, they're killing all this stuff in your body and it's like excess waste. Most people who are sick aren't breathing a lot and oxygenating their blood. So we found that when you freshly ozonate water and drink it right after that, it's unstable. If you have a blood oxygen sensor in your fingertip, your oxygen level will spike and it'll help the body dump these toxins. Now, a lot of people are combining back protocol with the Holoclark herbs and cleanses. The Holoclark had a book called The Cure for All Diseases and Cure for All Cancers. She died in her mid-80s a few years ago, as did Beck and as did the other guys. Beck died before <coughs> the other guys. And uh, Robert Becker died about 90. They all died like a year or two of each other. But Holoclark found there's a strong correlation between 
parasites and cancers. Like if she tested 20 people with the same kind of cancer, they'd all test positive for the same kind of parasite. And here in America, we think we don't have parasites, but she also found that about two-thirds of Americans have parasites, and if you have pets, you're almost 100% guaranteed that you get parasites living in you. They're just generally not so bad that you're aware of them. And these parasites tend to harbor viruses and toxins that contribute to building cancers. So people where you're combining back protocol with all those herbal cleanses and herbal deparasiting program and succeeding in, in kicking stage four and five cancers. Uh, and come, and people have been sent home after chemo and radiation. And if you go online and just Google Beck protocol and, and, and click on things to see part one and part two about the Beck protocol, you'll see amazing testimony of people who are sent home to die. It's that you know, you had the radish, we cut you up, we radiated you, we chemoed you, and there's nothing more you can do and get a hold of hospice and die. And two years later, they come back and blow their doctors away because they're totally cancer free. It might be minus some body parts from the earlier stuff, but they're cancer free. So um, I think we're running out of time. Is that what you're saying? So I'll just run through these oh, EMP solar storms. Well, I'm going to go and sign and sell copies of my books. Uh, the big book is 35 list, and the big and small one is 25. I'll do a deal for both for 50, or list on each one. Um, if someone is really financially strapped, then talk to me, and we'll work something out. Uh, and uh, and I'll be free to answer questions. I'm going to sit at a table right next to the signing table, right right over there across the yard a little bit. And so, let's see. Okay, well. Now I see, uh, I talked too much on some things, but I talked about some good stuff, so. <laughs> okay, and I can probably give you a copy of this if you want to post it online, so people can look at this. Now, one planet, one people, we're all in the same lifeboat. And here's my motto, I like to leave my motto with, I ask everyone to do your best to change the world and do your best to be ready for the changes in the world. And Thank you for listening to me. I hope I didn't talk too fast. God bless you. Good luck.